you know, we're going to go from the more explicit ruminative kind of approach uh, component to the implicit emotion regulation uh, approach that has been really pioneered by our next speaker, Matt Nock, who is the Edgar Pierce Professor of Psychology at Harvard and is obviously one of the leading, become one of the leading researchers in suicide, developed a very uh, clever and innovative method for looking at implicit emotion re uh, regulation uh, and it's an area that uh, we've been interested in, become interested in and have actually started to apply Matt, Matt Knox's uh, technology in a study we're doing on ketamine. Uh, Matt Nock is uh, obviously very well published, been recognized by numerous grants and awards, particularly a MacArthur Genius Award, uh, and we are delighted to, to have him here today to talk about how new technologies are changing the way we study and treat suicidal uh, behaviors. Matt. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Schatzberg, Dr. Jacobs, the organizers of this meeting, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. So my name is Matt Nock, and I am going to talk today as advertised about using new technologies to advance our understanding of suicidal behavior, focusing, as Dr. Schatzberg said, primarily on trying to improve our ability to predict and prevent suicidal behavior. And I will, I will get through these slides in about 20 minutes and then really look forward to uh, any questions and discussion uh, that we may be able to have. In terms of disclosures and conflicts, I have no conflicts of interest to report. I will disclose that I do receive some publication royalties from a few different sources listed here, and I've been a paid, paid and unpaid consultant uh, and advisor for a few different uh, entities, none of which presents a conflict from my perspective for the work that I'm going to present here today. So you've already heard, if you've been in this uh, workshop for a bit, about suicide, so I'll spend just a few quick minutes talking about uh, the context for what I want to present. We know, uh, we've known for a long time that suicide is a really complex problem. It's something that we as humans have been focused on and trying to understand for literally thousands of years for, for, for a very long time. Uh, understanding suicide fell in the domain of, of, of philosophical inquiry. It's only been the past hundred years or so that medical professionals, professionals have tried to um, address this problem. And we still have a long way to go. So suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the US. And whereas uh, the mortality rate for many leading causes of death in the US has dropped precipitously over the past hundred years. Think about how medical science and the implementation of medical science has led to decreases in things like cancers, pneumonia, accidents, HIV, AIDS, COVID more recently, and so on. We haven't seen the same progress in, in the area of suicide. And the suicide rate today is the same as it was about a hundred years ago. The rate has been increasing the past few decades, but if we look at the suicide rate from literally hundred years ago, uh, it's it's virtually identical to where we are now. So there's, there's some, been some ebbs and flows, but we haven't made the same kind of progress. As you've heard about already today, we have identified some risk factors. We have some promising interventions, but I would argue uh, that our progress has been slow and in many ways, unacceptably stagnant. Uh, some of my colleagues may see this picture differently and can certainly, I'm happy to argue this point as... W. Edwards Deming has said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. So I brought some data on, on, on this point to try and take a, a, a sort of fresh, honest look at where we are. So our research team, led by uh, one of our, our researchers named Joe Franklin, did a, a meta-analysis about five years ago now, where we looked at the progress we've made over the past 50 years in the prediction of suicidal behavior. And I'll focus here on predicting non-lethal suicide attempts and suicide death. And I'll re refer back to this meta-analysis just a few times in my time today. One thing we wondered about, and I'll show here, is how we made progress in identifying increasingly strong risk factors for suicide. And what I want to show from left to right are the progress we've made over the past 50 years. So we're looking here in 20, 20 year and then 10 year bins. And what I want to look at on the vertical axis are the, the odds ratios of our predictors over the past 50 years. An odds ratio of one means that uh, a potential predictor isn't associated with an increase in the likelihood odds of suicidal outcomes. The higher the number, the stronger the risk factor. We'd wanna see the bars I'm gonna show increase from left to right. But what we actually see is, I think the best interpretation is a flat line. If anything, it looks like maybe they're getting weaker over time. So we haven't been identifying stronger and stronger risk factors 
to help us in our clinical predictions. Why might that be? Well, if we look at what risk factors we as researchers have been examining over the past 50 years, we see that we've been looking at essentially the same kinds of risk factors over and over again. And if you look at the top, the top categories of risk factors that researchers have examined over the past 50 years, we see that we've been pretty consistently looking at sociodemographics, age, gender, race, ethnicity, DSM, internalizing symptoms, externalizing symptoms, prior self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, and negative life events. Those are the top five consistently over the past 50 years. They change in order slightly, but this is what we've been focusing on. And in fact, in about 75 to 80% of all prediction cases, of all analyses that we've done and published, we've looked at these five factors. And we've done it using largely self-report interviews and surveys. And so through that lens, it's perhaps not surprising that if we're looking at the same predictors, we're using the same methods, we shouldn't be surprised that we're seeing the same results. And so I would argue, we would argue, what we need is new approaches. And what we're arguing for here is the use of newer technologies to try and uh, do things differently and, and bridge some of the gaps that we see. And I'm going to talk about two gaps with the, with the time that I have in particular. Um, both are research issues, but they're also really uh, important clinical uh, concerns. The first is we need methods for better combining information about known risk factors. And I'll talk more about what that means in a moment. And we also need better data on imminent risk of suicidal behavior. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So I'll spend the rest of my time talking about these two, um, I think, important issues. In terms of combining risk factors, we, we have identified, researchers have identified uh, risk factors over the years. You've heard about some of these already in talks today. These are data from the meta-analysis that I was just describing. And these are our strongest risk factors for suicide death over the past 50 years. Um, if we look at this first bar, treatment history, being in treatment is associated with a threefold increase in your odds of suicide death, presumably not because our treatments are killing people, but because those who are most clinically severe are, are more likely to make their way into treatment. After that, if you look from less, left to right, all of our strongest risk factors have about the same odds ratio. They increase your risk, your odds by about 50%. There's no one factor that does it. We think about suicide as resulting from the combination of many different factors. Unfortunately, research over the past 50 years, 99% of analyses that have been published look at one risk factor at a time. There have been really few efforts that combine risk factors in, in, in making predictions about who is at risk. And this is a problem for our clinical predictions. Uh, the human brain isn't designed to assess dozens of risk factors, weight them, combine those weights, and make a predicted probability of suicide death, which is what we're asking clinicians to do in emergency settings, in inpatient settings, and in outpatient settings. And this is where new technology, we think, can come in. Um, and I'll talk about how we, we can use advances in computing and, and statistics to try and um, bridge this gap. And I'll do this using a, uh, an example study. This is done by our colleague, Ron Kessler at Harvard Medical School. And what Ron and team did was try and improve the prediction of which patients die by suicide in the year after a psychiatric hospitalization, which is an extremely high risk period for suicide death. In fact, the, the two weeks after someone leaves a psychiatric hospitalization is the highest risk time for dying by suicide. We know that patients leaving a psychiatric hospitalization are at high risk of suicide, but we don't know which ones are at highest risk. So we don't really know where to allocate our valuable resources. So what Kessler and, and colleagues did was look at patients' electronic medical records, electronic health records, and other administrative data that were available, and use machine learning methods to generate risk scores for each patient for each hospitalization. And so what they did was build models that used all of the data available from electronic sources, didn't talk to a single patient, before the hospitalization. So when the patient set foot in the hospital, the computer gen would generate a predicted probability of suicide attempt after hospitalization for this patient. And they did this looking at over 50,000 hospitalizations over a six year period. And this is done, done among, among army soldiers uh, because the suicide rate among army soldiers has increased dramatically in the past few decades. And so each patient gets a predicted probability of suicide death in the year after hospitalization. And I'll show you the results. To orient you, this figure shows um, all hospitalizations in 5% bins, so in 25% bins. So this one are the top 5% of risk scores, that two is, you can think of it as a sixth to 10th percentile and so on. And on the vertical axis, hopefully you can see my mouse, is the percentage of all suicides that fell within each bin. 
So what we'd like to see is more suicides in the higher risk bins. And in fact, that's what we see. And what we saw here that more than half of all suicides fell into that first 5% bin. And we often think about looking for the suicidal patient as looking for a needle in, in, a, in a haystack. So what was done here effectively was take the hayfield, separate it into 20 different stacks. Over half the needles were in that first stack. So we see a really high concentration of risk, whereas the suicide rate in the Army is 18 per 100,000. In this first bin, it's 3,800 per 100,000. So a really high concentration of risk. On the flip side, in terms of clinical um, utility here, let's call this number 4,000 per 100,000 or four and 100. Although there's a high concentration of risk in this top 5%, only four out of every 100 people in that bin ended up dying by suicide. So 96 out of 100, we could think of as false positives for suicide. So many in, in the field and many clinicians would say, well, this is an unacceptably high false positive rate. Interesting twist here was that in this top 5% group, if folks didn't die by suicide, half of them, so 46% either died by suicide or died by accident, made a suicide attempt in the next year or had a rehospitalization, which illustrates that these models that predict suicide predict a range of different behaviors, that, uh, adverse events that seem to hang together, making this more clinically actionable. So if we were able to tell clinicians in, in inpatient settings, these 5% of patients, half of them are gonna have a, a negative outcome over the past year that would argue for allocating extra resources to those specific patients. And again, this is done just with technology, not talking to any patients. This is an adjunct to what we're currently doing, um, all done with data lying dormant in patients' medical records. This was done in the Army. Will this work more generally? Yes, there's a group at um, Mass General Hospital and Boston Children's Hospital who looked at about 2 million covered lives in the Harvard healthcare system, the Mass General Brigham system, and found similar prediction accuracy, and then replicated this just a few years ago, uh, looking at five different healthcare systems around the country. So taking these uh, this algorithmic algorithmic approach, plugging it, plugging it into Epic medical records, showing that this replicates, this approach replicates with similar prediction accuracy at different places around the United States, suggesting this could be uh, used more broadly for identifying those at greatest risk. Um, more recently, uh, we, uh, our broad research team has showed we can get even stronger prediction accuracy if we pull in other sources of data. So for instance, we looked at 2000 patients passing through an emergency department with a psychiatric complaint and followed them up one month later to see, can we predict who makes a suicide attempt in the next month? And we use the same approach I just mentioned, machine learning applied to electronic health records. But we also gave patients an iPad and asked them to, report, to give our, their self-report on some known risk factors for suicide. And we asked clinicians to make a prediction about each patient regarding risk of suicide attempt. I'm gonna show some numbers here that, that are um, area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, AUC. They range from zero to one. 0.5 is a coin toss. One is perfect prediction. When we ask clinicians, uh, we see clinicians are not so much greater than chance. I'm a clinician myself. We're just historically not very good at making these predictions. When we use machine learning applied to health records, we see we, we get better. When we combine machine learning and self-report, we get our best prediction. Uh, and in the prior slide, I showed that that model, uh, that modeling approach had uh, four out of 100 patients determined to be at risk, uh, had a suicide event during follow-up. Using this approach, 30 out of 100 had a, a suicide attempt in the next month, suggesting um, more actionable um, results when we bring in additional sources of information. And we're able to, to, with only 20 items, so a quick four minute scale, see that we can do as well as a much longer battery, making this again, more clinically feasible. Uh, this is research to date, but just this past summer, we started implementing this in some local hospitals, returning results to clinicians in emergency departments about whether each patient passing through as at high, medium, or low risk, and, and clinicians report they like getting this information, found it really helpful um, for their decision making. So we're looking forward to um, disseminating and scaling this up more broadly. I'm going to switch gears in the few minutes I have left and talk about um, the need for data on imminent risk. So we clinicians want to know in in interviewing, evaluating patients who is at risk for suicide right now. Um, so. What period do existing research studies cover in terms of making these predictions? Again, looking back to this meta-analysis, if we look at from research studies, when an assessment of risk factors is done until a suicide event occurs, 
we see that in about a quarter of all analyses that have been published so far, researchers are making predictions 10 years or more into the future about suicidal outcomes. In a sense, it's helpful if you can predict something happening 10 or more years into the future. Clinically, it's not so helpful to say, hey, this patient's gonna make a suicide attempt or die by suicide 10 plus years into the future. About a quarter of studies look at five to 10 years, about another 25, 30% look at one to, to five years. What percentage of studies look at the window that I think we as clinicians are most interested in? Uh, let's call it the next four weeks, the next month. Although even that's pushing it a little bit. If you ask ED clinicians, those of us working in inpatient settings, we wanna know tomorrow, the next day, the next day. But just looking at within one month, only one-tenth of 1% 1 of published studies have looked at uh, the risk of suicidal outcomes after you assess for risk factors from now until four weeks into the future. So literally 99.9% .9 of all studies have looked at a time window that's not so clinically useful. So we need much better data on the natural unfolding uh, of, of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Uh, we did an initial study on this, measuring people's suicidal thoughts, giving them palm pilots is a little over 10 years ago, measuring suicidal thoughts two times a day for a few weeks. Now, at least in the US, the vast majority of people have smartphones that they carry around at all times. Um, so we've all become effectively cyborgs collecting digital information and providing digital information in real time. And so we've been doing studies where we ping people four to six times a day. These are people who say they've had th they're having thoughts of suicide ping them four to six times a day and ask about their suicidal thoughts. And we've been following them largely for about a month. And we asked them questions that look like this. So right now, how intense is your desire to kill yourself? How strong is your intention to kill yourself? How strong is your ability to resist the urge to kill yourself? And what I'm gonna show you is just some, some basic descriptive data that we've plotted, wanting to get a sense of what is the ebb and flow of suicidal thoughts. If we have in this first study, this is work um, led by one of our trainees, Evan Kleiman, who's now a professor at Rutgers. If we have 50 people who are saying they're having thoughts of suicide, what do those suicidal thoughts look like? Do they increase? Do they decrease? Are they flat over time? And here's what we see. This is just, these are roughly 50 different tiles. Each one is a different person. On the horizontal axis for each one is a one month passage of time, four week passage of time. On the vertical axis is basically the sum of those three questions I just showed you. And what you might note here is that there's a lot of variability, a lot of up and down within person, and there seems to be a lot of variability across people. We wondered, are there different subtypes or the different profiles of suicidal thinking? Uh, we stared at these data for a number of hours and didn't see anything uh, with the naked eye. Uh, Evan Kleiman then had the, the good idea to do a latent profile analysis. So to, to look statistically to see, are there different profiles, uh, different subtypes of suicidal thinking? And I'll show you in the next slide, the same exact tiles reorganized. And we do see um, five different subtypes or profiles of suicidal thinking that vary based on the mean or average level within each person and the amount of variability within each person. So those, those individuals shown here in green have low mean, uh, low variability suicidal thinking. So a lot of zeros with little ones and twos. In yellow, we see low mean, high variability, so they're much peakier. Those in purple, at least purple for me, have moderate mean, moderate variability. Those in red, high mean, low variability. You'll note that they're never coming down to zero. And those in blue on the bottom, high mean, high variability. There are a lot of ups and downs. We looked, to, there were no suicide attempts during this one month period for this small sample of participants, which were most likely to have made a recent suicide attempt. It turns out it's those in red, which in hindsight makes sense. We often hear from, from, from those struggling with suicidal thoughts that suicide uh, is a way to escape from seemingly intolerable psychological or, or, or life situations. So having persistent thoughts of suicide not coming to zero stands to reason that someone would want to escape from this kind of situation. Um, but again, we didn't look prospectively. There weren't prospective suicide attempts in this sample. We did get another sample, run a latent profile analysis, and the same five profiles emerged, suggesting to us that maybe this is a, a stable way to, to think about suicidal thoughts. And we're doing research now where we're following um, 600 patients over a six month period of time to see, do we see the same profiles? Do we see people moving from green to yellow to red? Um, is this red pattern, the high mean, low variability, most predictive of suicide attempts? And we're also doing a lot of passive monitoring um, for, with apps on people's smartphones, looking at GPS, accelerometer, uh, wrist-worn 
wrist-worn biosensor data, which allows us to look at sleep um, and other, other parameters. And we're building models um, to find within person when, are the, when is the highest risk period for suicidal attempts so we can reach out and intervene. And the last thing I'll, I'll cover very quickly is what do we do when we intervene in the moment? If we're able to, with technology, find who's at risk and when they're at highest risk, what should we do in the moment? And so what we currently do, or a lot of us currently do now, is when we find someone at risk for suicidal thoughts and behaviors, we refer them to crisis services. But we know from surveying people at risk that many of them, the majority, don't use those services. Historically, we have things like barrier reduction interventions, which are used across different uh, psychological approaches to identify people at risk, identify barriers to getting care, and intervene to reduce those barriers. One example of this is my own dissertation work done over 15 years ago uh, with my brilliant PhD advisor, Alan Kasdan, where over a period of two years, we did a randomized control trial with 76 people. Some got a barrier reduction intervention, some didn't. We found that those who got the, this face-to-face -face brief intervention were significantly more likely to get care, to be engaged in care, to be adherent to care, and so on. What's exciting about new uh, technological approaches is we can do this much more rapidly and scale it much more rapidly. So one of our PhD students, Adam Jaruszewski, did effectively a replication of this, a, bar a new barrier reduction intervention, but in just five weeks, screened 40,000 people and did a randomized control trial with 1,500 of them. And this was done in collaboration with a platform called COCO, which is a safety net for social networks. Very briefly, it's a, a platform that runs on social media networks and on text apps. And it uses machine learning algorithms to find people in distress. And what we did was a really quick little barrier reduction intervention. I'll show you in just 30 seconds what this looked like. So this is in someone's text interface. Gray is this COCO bot. Blue is me. The bot determined I'm at risk. So it said, hey, what country are you in? I said, I'm in the US. So they said, here are some common resources you can use, crisis lines and so on. It's very common to disseminate these to people at risk. Those who were in the control condition got nothing else. Those who were in the treatment condition got a little message saying, so how, be honest, how likely are you to use these resources? If I said very likely, we're done. If I clicked on not likely, now here's the intervention. It's very quick. It says basically, here are some reasons people don't use this intervention. Don't call a crisis line. Which are most relevant to you? I just want to chat. I can't use my phone. I don't want the police called. So I click on no police. This is the intervention. It says most calls to crisis centers don't end with the police or paramedics showing up. This is extremely, extremely rare, like less than 1% rare. Okay. Just this little automated chat button led to a 23% increase in the use of crisis services. Uh, which is amazing given this is really brief, fully automated, and totally scalable. So in conclusion, um, we're seeing better um, prediction using electronic health records and other data sources. We're seeing improvements in short-term prediction and intervention. Um, some challenges I didn't discuss are, well, how do we deliver these risk scores to clinicians, to patients? And there's all sorts of ethical issues in doing this kind of monitoring and intervening without getting full consent um, that we can certainly talk about. And I'll end by thanking our very generous funders, and our brilliant collaborators on this work uh, and our conference organizers. And I look forward to any questions that people may have. Thank you. Matt, thank you. That was great. Um, one of the risk factors you identified obviously is family history. Would you speak briefly as to um, how you define that? Is, is it a particular diagnosis, a family history of any mental health diagnosis, a family history of suicidality? Yeah, so I think you're referring to the meta-analytic findings that I showed. I forget if we plot it there, family history of suicide or family history of psychopathology. Both are risk factors for suicide in offspring. So uh, there's been um, seminal work by David Brent, who I know presented earlier, showing suicide um, traveling, suicide risk traveling within specific families, even more specific than depression. Uh, we also know that family history of psychopathology increases risk of suicidal outcomes. And we've seen in cross-national work, looking at suicide behavior in over two dozen countries, pretty interesting findings where family history of um, depression and generalized anxiety increases offspring risk of thinking about suicide and the persistence of your suicidal thoughts. So maybe due, due to some depressive ruminative um, risk factor, fa parental history of antisocial personality disorder, panic disorder predicts acting on your suicidal thoughts among offspring. So there seem to be some uh, sort of suicide pathway specific traits that get transmitted through specific forms of psychopathology. So, there, so overall, there is an association between parent psychopathology and suicidal behavior and offspring, but some recent findings suggest even more specific pathways than that. 
Very interesting, thank you. Um, in some of the studies, um, is there any kind of connection between the people doing the study and maybe a primary care or a clinician in the in the patient's life? Meaning that if you are seeing that someone is at an elevated risk, is there any of the potential for communication with the provider? Absolutely. Um, we, along with um, David Brent and, and other, other, others in the scientific, psychiatric, um, bioethics community, uh, in collaboration with NIMH, did a consensus meeting a few years ago about how to do this work ethically. Um, and there, was a, a, there wasn't consensus on everything, but one thing there was consensus about is if you're monitoring people in real time at, at risk for suicide, you should be in touch with either that person's clinician or at least some collateral contact in that person's life, parent, spouse, um, relative, so that when this person is at risk, uh, you have someone who can help that person get safe and get to care. Um, or if you can't, if that person says they're at risk, but you can't contact them, someone who can help you contact that person. So we do a lot of outreach. We do, you know, at any given time, we're mon monitoring potentially dozens of, of people at risk for suicide. And we have a very well worked out protocol for what do we do when someone says they plan to kill themselves today. And we reach out as quickly as we can. And we're starting to experiment with different ways of doing outreach with, with bots, um, automating, connecting people with others in their network, basically trying to get this um, real-time monitoring so that it's sort of self-maintaining uh, and helps a person keep themselves safe and learn how to access resources. And, and, and getting access to resources is a huge ongoing concern that we're trying to um, loop into the system. That's excellent. Thank you. Would you speak briefly about why um, the, how do I say, the suicide rate ends up being higher immediately following discharge from a medical setting? Mm-hmm. Why, why I think that is? Yeah, please. Um, I think a lot of people who are discharged from psychiatric hospitalization are still at really high risk for suicide. I mean, right now, I'm gonna cartoon this a little bit, but our, our decision-making about who's going into hospitals and who's getting ready to leave is based largely on patient self-report on how they say that they're doing, um, what they say is happening with their suicidal thoughts. And a lot of people passing through inpatient hospitalizations say that they're feeling better, closer to discharge. And I think I'm sure that contributes to the discharge. When we do smartphone monitoring of patients during their hospitalization, and these are research data, they don't get returned, they haven't historically been uh, returned to clinical teams, we see a pretty flat line in people's report of suicidal thinking. Their, their suicidal thoughts in general are not coming down. Um, so we think what's happening here is some people are, are still having pretty intense thoughts of suicide, pretty strong suicidal intent. They're saying that is now absent, or maybe in the moment, you saw this up and down pattern, it, it is absent, they're being discharged, um, and they haven't yet gotten better, they're, 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 they're still at very high risk. So we're hopeful that using approaches like this in combination with um, implicit tests that Dr. Schatzberg mentioned, um, some, some biomarkers, some, 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 some um, other objective approaches, we can get better data and provide clinicians with better data about patients' actual level of risk. Do we have any data around crisis lines, um, in particular around people that are at risk in the moment versus long-term prevention of suicide through use of them? through use of crisis lines. I don't know, most of the data that I know about on crisis lines are sort of short-term reports of, for those who call crisis lines, how are they doing after, after um, either immediately after or in the weeks after their calling of the crisis line. I haven't seen, I've seen proposals to, to, to do studies on longer term look. Um, for instance, the VA has, is a nice health system where um, VA has data on, on veterans who are accessing veterans um, care. VA care, Veterans Crisis Line can connect to those outcomes and look prospectively into the future. So there are ways of evaluating um, the effectiveness of, of crisis lines. I think we haven't fully tapped into uh, the potential of evaluating them. So I think we don't quite know exactly how effective they are at the moment. Is, I'm gonna ask Matt a question. Sure, Doug, go ahead. You know, I, I was really struck by your, when you're talking about that the suicidal thoughts you know, don't go down that flat line. And, mm -hmm. you know, I consider myself an old fashioned clinical guy. Yep. And so is it, you know, because one of the things that I, you know, I teach residents and I work with, if someone has suicidal thoughts, you want to try to understand the context in which they occurred. Mm -hmm. And as if they're going down, what do they see has changed or what could bring mm -hmm. them back? So is it, is, is, uh, is, is an advice you have for clinicians as they're working with patients in hospital is just to make sure, sure that they, uh, um, they, 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 they ask that question. I think so. I, I don't know the answer. I, all I know is you know, the data we have and how well they do at predicting. So I don't wanna make speculation beyond that. 
we're, we're now having a lot more conversations with clinicians like yourself to say, how do we make sense of this data and how, how could you potentially use these data? One thing I didn't mention is, so we monitor people inpatient and then try and with smartphones and then try and make a prediction of who is most at risk for suicide attempt after discharge. We can predict pretty well which patients are at risk. The strongest predictor in our model is probability of acute change in suicidal thinking. People come down, then they have a big spike up. Um, the clinicians we talked to said, yep, that makes sense, that tracks. How do we start giving this kind of information to clinicians in inpatient settings to help them with their decision-making? And what data aren't we collecting yet that might be helpful to clinicians? So we're trying to get much more of a, um, a cycle going of, of um, trying to learn from clinicians and get them data that, that might be helpful in making better, uh, more accurate predictions about who's most at risk which can then inform decisions about what do we do with, with resource allocation? Which patients passing through seem to be doing much better and have a good um, prognosis? Which ones are we still really concerned about based on the data that are coming in? Thanks, Matt. All right, Matt, thank you so much for, uh, for being with us today. It was, it was great to hear what, everything you guys have going on.